Hello and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me are Joe and Chris. It's good to have you guys back this week. We have a lot of really great uh, news topics to talk about, but they should take up a good amount of time because <laughs> they are very interesting. But first off, what are you guys drinking? Zombie dust. I mean, that's always fair. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saving it all from all, all from or from for you guys. I am, uh, I am drinking water to replenish my tear ducts from <laughs> all of the emotional strain that has happened this weekend. <laughs> Between Endgame and Game of Thrones, man, it's been rough. <laughs> it's been a, it's been an emotional weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen either. <laughs> Aaron just hates everything that anyone else likes. So, like, it, like I think Aaron's favorite things in the world are black jelly beans and Malort. And, uh... Hey, you I, gave me Malort at Rep, at Rep Rep Fest. <laughs> I think that's what killed me. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? That was, that was the sure thing was. that set it over the edge. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was. I drank it too, and I was able to do interviews the next day just fine. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get Aaron the the shirt from a long time ago. If if anybody who listens to us is an original RVB fan that just says, I hate all the bands that you like. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I you're just, gonna get hit, hit a point where you're actually going to like popular things, and you're, then you're going to be like, "But I, but I do like that." And <laughs> it's just it's like, no, it's a trope now. You can't like anything. It's gonna be a whole identity crisis. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, what are you drinking, man? I have a flying dog bloodline, which is a blood orange ale. Ooh, ah, that stuff's it's, so good. Yeah, Joe and I had some earlier this week when he dropped off the mini mill. Very nice, very very nice. I bought a CNC mini mill off Joe this week, and I'm really excited to to learn more about it. Yeah, the baby mill project is now Aaron's responsibility. I I got it to the point where it was a functional tool, and then I handed it off to somebody else because I didn't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I make almost... things with my tools. <laughs> Day, but then it was too chilly mostly because i'm wearing like a tank top and shorts welcome to the, the world of, of cnc makers where they just make excuses on why they don't make things with their tools exactly <laughs> <laughs> oh man do you guys want to do a quick project update do you have any I have dude some. i have so many things i want to start like so now that the baby mill's done, I want to get back to my grizzly mill that has sat for two and a half years because I had access to Tormox and I don't have access to my Tormox anymore. So now I need a mill again. So now that's going to get a, a motor or a spindle motor upgrade. Um, when I worked on it last time, the Y axis was getting a new bearing block for low backlash. Uh, that's done. I just need to reassemble everything. Um, and I am looking into, uh, doing ethernet Mesa cards for CNC control with hardware stepping and, um, like doing it really legit. So nice. I'm pretty excited about that. Nice. I'm going to look at, into putting path pilot on it. So I have a really nice conversational control. If I don't hit path pilot, why, why are you sticking your tongue out? It's all is Linux that... CNC based. And oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> It's just a skin that Tormach makes for Linux CNC. So yeah, I heard I heard that, and I just assumed it was closed. Uh, My yeah, it's not open, but it's not closed. So it's like a proprietary plugin for Linux CNC, or it's a proprietary skin. But all of the updates that they made to Linux CNC to make it work, they pushed upstream. So like they rewrote the path planner. And they rewrote a bunch of communication things. And Linux CNC benefited from all of the background work that they had to do to make all their stuff work well. Uh, but they didn't push the skin because that's what their machines run on. And that's kind of like part of the selling point of their machines. Uh, so, like, there's 
I feel like that's okay. Yeah, it's it's pretty okay. They did a lot yeah. of work to make everything pretty great for people, so. And if you have just a little bit of smarts, you can buy their path pilot upgrade and and put it on your machine and they're not going to go after you for it. You just have to there's a little bit of work and a small amount of money that you have to pay. So fair enough. It's it's not terrible. Chris, any project updates? Um right now no. Um I'm actually getting ready to move. Um I'm going to be staying in the area, but I'm going to be kind of switching houses. So kind of all my projects are on pause for right now. I do have one kind of thing that is happening currently that I'll talk a little bit about in our main topic. Um, but I'll save that for that um, and go into a little bit more detail on that. But yeah. Fair enough. How about yourself? So I finished my Emblazer Core Kit build. Nice. Finished it last Tuesday. Didn't have any time to work on it until today where I was given all day to myself. So that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I finally took the time to get the software set up on it. Got Lightburn set up. Uh, I had to go through and organize and kind of go through like an entire area that has just been like a storage pile of stuff for over the past like four years of like documents and manuals and spare parts. And I wanted the table because it was right by a window and an outlet. Yeah. So I had to spend like two hours cleaning that. And I have like two garbage bags full of crap that gets to be thrown out now. <laughs> Always a good day. <laughs> it is a really productive day. So like now I have like a proper clean table and I've got the core set up and I've got a nice little laptop stand and I knocked out like 30 laser cut business cards today on it. Sweet. So nice. I'm really excited for that. Uh, I updated my maker business card, which has uh, my name, uh, my personal email, my project portfolio website, and my Twitter handle. Yes. I got all that going. Um, what else? Got the mini mill this week, so I'm excited to learn more mill stuff. That's about it for me. Aaron and I had a great discussion on why decimal level precision doesn't matter in feed rates this week. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I I I understand that it's not doesn't matter, but I still don't like it. Whole numbers are far easier to deal with when it comes to feed rates. To who? To to anyone. When I, if I I don't think the computer cares. It, it, yeah, but if I if you if you asked me. How fast are you going to run that end mill in that MDF? And I say yeah. 100 inches a minute. Do you sit there and you wait a minute and you look at that bit? No, I just know how. And fast then you say, that is. "Well, a minute ago, I know it was I about just, 100 millimeters away, 100 inches, and now it's no, about but 100 it's, millimeters from before." Okay, but like, whereas if you said you know it's moving at 10 millimeters a second, you can sit there for a second and be like, "That's about 10 millimeters." You can just kind of eyeball it. Yeah, but at or the same like... time, 100 inches a minute is one, what was it, 1.6 inches per second? So it gets really granular. Well, yeah, at that point. It's, at the it's, faster it's, it... speeds. Yes. Yeah, but it, millimeters are the same. Yeah, but it, it's just, It would it's, be it's... 35 millimeters per second, or I think it's, I think it's like 3,000 millimeters per minute. It, 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 the the difference is insane and it's the great thing is you can just like what divide by 100 and go to the next step up that's the whole point yeah machines are picky on the the input units though yeah yeah well, I was telling Joe that and as a developer it just bugs the crap out of me that all the machinist stuff is done in like you know in, inches a minute definitions because you can have your machine defined in millimeters or inches like the mini mill is defined in millimeters but I programmed it all in inches because it's a G code to flip flop it's G20 versus G21 and it's all in the header of the code it's all in your cam so it's whatever units you're comfortable with as a machinist yeah I'm going to fix that all, all of the guys that I 
I learned from were old school, so they all worked in inches. So that's what I got comfortable with. And, uh, you know, now when I try to talk to Josh about machining units, he's like, oh, I'm traveling at 50,000 millimeters per minute. And I'm like, I don't what's that in a unit that I can deal with in my head? I, (laughs) I, I give me a second. I have to do all this math on my phone real quick so I can like break it down into units I can think about. And then I give it back to him in units he can't think about, and he has to do the same thing, and it's fun. (laughs) Uh, Yes, unit conversion. (laughs) I brought it up because at work, we we have a thing in one of our apps where we're asking for a cycle time in minutes, but then for some odd reason, the architect wanted to store it in the database in hours. So you got to, you know, divide by 60 to get into hours. But then whenever we display it, it goes back to minutes. I'm like, well, why not just store it in minutes? Like, why we, why, why is it even, why? Is it, is it a, like, uh, a places thing? Like you only have, you, no, you know, like it's like we 326 have like, minutes and you can only we have, have all like the places. two places. Like it's an, it's a, it's a shitty Oracle database. Like we have all the, all the precision we want. Hmm. So it's like, there's no reason to just not store it in minutes. I, I, I was even going to say, just store it in seconds. Like just multiply it by sixty and store it, store it in the most absolute value you can do. Why don't you do? Because then you never seconds. lose precision. Because now we're having issues where, you know, the user bring put something in and oh well, we gotta you know, multiply it back out to minutes. But you know, due to rounding, you lose some precision. And so now I gotta do stupid workarounds where I gotta like multiply by a thousand, then divide by a thousand, some like hacky workarounds to get it back and it sucks i'm like just store it the first time the right way the most absolute unit which is millimeters a second that's nah, yeah stupid Anyways, anyway news lasers travel millimeters <laughs> per minute or second in my head and cutting machines travel in inches per minute in my Sorry. head i had to get that <laughs> off my chest it bugged me for just right now yeah Chris, do you want to go over this real quick? The the VR, open source VR yeah. makers? Well, <clears throat> as much as I know about it, uh, there's a new project opening up that is talking about doing open source VR. Uh, the post popped up on Reddit on r slash maker for uh, an open source VR controller that they're doing. And um, currently, they are... In development of everything, uh, they do have a Discord that's currently ongoing, um, and some of the CAD files will be available in three months. So we just kind of wanted to bring it up, so that's something really freaking cool that they're doing. Uh, and if you want to know more, uh, we'll have links in the show notes for you to be able to go and find the resources available. Um, but yeah, we just kind of wanted to give them a little bit of a shout out for doing something so awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to see how that plays out. Yeah. Uh, Prusa Labs had a big update this week. They released a whole new, what would you call that? 3D model community? Community. where It's almost like Thingiverse where you can download models, but everything is sliced specifically for Prusa printers. They came out with that, and they came out with what he's calling the Prusa World, which is almost like a 3D hubs equivalent, where... You can find Prusa printers near you and have them print things for you. Um, there's a lot of controversy between both of those this week. Yes. So, with the 3D Prusa community site, they are sharing uh, directly uh, G code files that you can just throw right into your SD card and throw into your Prusa printer. And a lot of people have a lot of concerns with that because you're no longer slicing that model locally. So now you are trusting that the person slicing it has good intentions, you know, or good settings. Yeah. Specifically good intentions. I don't know. I think good settings. Like with a printer, it's really hard to break it, especially with a printer like the Prusas where they're firmware limited on their... um, thermals and that's not something that can be changed with the g-code 
Like that would have to be rewritten on firmware, so they couldn't melt down your hot end or your bed, right? And what yeah. else? Yeah. What else can you really do? Like you could you could crash a, a hot end into a bed, and like scrape the PEI, maybe break a heat break. But what what else could you do? Gina Gina posted like a bunch of G codes that could have done things. Did she? Yeah, on Twitter. I uh, if, if I remember, if I listen to this in post, I'll I'll add the link to the tweet. Okay. But there's she posted a whole because she was like the big proponent in the whole Twitter storm of pushback on this. Yeah. But she because like she she you know she develops Octoprint, and you know we we've, we've covered this on the show where Octoprint some people were you know exposing their Octoprint services to the World Wide Web, and that's a security concern. Yes. And so she's fully well aware of, you know, software security concerns. And she saw that, you know, if you're if you're downloading direct G code that just goes straight to the printer, you are essentially bypassing every sort of safety concern yeah. that is handled in your slicer. So I'm going to be the one who hasn't looked a whole bunch into this one. What is the process of uploading the G code? So if we're looking at like a thingiverse kind of model or this is what they're trying to go for it, if i wanted to upload a model and my g code could i just do that or is it does it go through a filter does it go through um any kind of like filtering before like a review yeah so that's a good point chris um joseph prusa did say they have some sort of smart g code filtering like they're they're somehow analyzing the G code coming in to try and you know prevent any malicious G code from happening. I think what he's doing is it's it's certainly innovative. Like no one else is doing this, but sometimes you got to ask you know why is anybody doing this? Yeah. Well, you know, I I it's, it, for me that seems pretty simple. Like this is for end user support. This is to make it even easier for the person who just wants to print something to make it easier he's he's doing what what a lot of people want which is to make 3d printing even easier if you don't even have to go through the slicing process and worry about how to actually do that then that's just going to turn more people on to his device because they don't have to learn cura they don't have to learn simplify like that seems pretty yeah. smart to me like i understand the concerns but overall i could totally get what he's going for yeah but as a user that has had to run other people's codes on multiple machines, I don't like running other people's code. No. So don't <laughs> don't take what I'm saying like that I support it completely. I'm just oh, trying yeah. to like play devil's advocate. I'm like one of the biggest proponents of one size doesn't freaking fit all. Like yeah. you're always going to have an issue if you try and unify everything. I am... I am cased through and through with work that one size does not freaking fit all <laughs> because like the more that you try and unify everything, the more you're going to have these one shot issues that, Oh, somebody just happened to replace this cable. Like it could be easy enough. It could be something like, Oh, somebody didn't have a USB 3.0 cable laying around. So they used a 2.0 cable. And now that this is having all kinds of weird issues because they yeah. just wanted to replace it. And so like, no, like I don't like it. I I'm just trying to play devil's ad advocate for yeah. why it's happening. I think it's a good point. I mean, you can buy a fully assembled i3 or Mark III from yeah. Prusa, so you can buy a fully assembled printer, and then with this new thing, you can just download these G code files, throw them right on the SD card, and they just print. You could so, theoretically be printing within like 30 minutes if you yeah. were to do yeah. it. Yeah. I can I can see the value in that, but you know, also being being you know all of us being on the technical side, we also understand that there's also a lot of security and safety concerns that go along with this because he is in uncharted territory right now. So it'll be interesting to see what they come come up with to you know verify all this stuff and make it work. Yeah, I'll be interested to know if they actually release kind of like their back end of how they're actually filtering. I doubt they will, but I would be super interested to see what they count as malicious or as non beneficial code that could be possibly in there that they're stripping out. Um, that seems really interesting, to be honest. 
it was uh, it was actually pretty funny during all this uh tom sam ladder it was like hmm and he's gonna try and upload some malicious g code to see what would get caught and what wouldn't <laughs> and then in, in joseph's uh update on the on the article he he's like we got our eye on you tom <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny so that's only half the news for that segment the second half was the new prusa world which was the 3d hubs thing yeah which was you know find find prusa printers near you and i think you can like request prints to be done or something on it yeah i didn't get we have yeah. a print on demand you can filter by print Print on demand, tech support, show and tell, and unclaimed Prusa printers. Yeah, tech support. So you can get like local help for your printer, which is pretty neat. The the concern came though was that when this was announced, you know, you would uh, pull up your zip code in your area and see that oh hey, you know, I pulled in my zip code and there's two there's two pr- Prusa printers in my zip code, but I don't remember giving Prusa you know permission to release my address. Yeah. for any of this and that was the big concern he just said here's the prusa world thing and you can go out and see where all these printers are and he's using all existing customer information to plug in in this area there are, you know x number of prusa printers and we're not going to give specific addresses because you know he cares about privacy quote unquote so we're just going to lump it all into a zip code so in the zip code there are 10 Prusas. But that zip code can be very detailed depending on the country that you're in. Yeah. Apparently in some countries, a zip code is a specific building and it's not just a city or, you know, a couple cities. I, I was a bit concerned just because there's only two in East Peoria and I was like, one of them's mine. And I didn't say that was okay. <laughs> uh, he came out with that update and said, and he gave some more explanation with how they handled the, the customer information, which was they took all the addresses and then they you know lumped them into a zip code and they did some other stuff. Everything's super randomized and anonymized, but I don't know. I'll tell you that there's two in Metamora and neither of them are me, and there's a Prusa printer sitting here. So that's interesting. Yeah, so right now, if you didn't, specifically give information to have your information released uh you're just a gray dot on a random point in the map and after you zoom in to a certain point that all the dots disappear so it's like it, it's it's to the city level in our area uh but um it is still a little concerning that he's like hey i've got all these printers in this area it, it yeah. feels like a bit of a misuse of information. And I honestly, I'm shocked that Prusa did it. Like, this is something I would see from MakerBot or like one of the other companies that's more on the money grab side and not on the uh, open free hardware side. Right. So that that's one of the arguments that Tom had and Gina had which was this is clearly just a way to get more dots on the map. Mm. He, he doesn't want to succumb to the social media effect where it's a brand new thing and nobody's on it. If nobody's on it, nobody's going to get on it. Yeah. So he leveraged his existing customer information database to populate his map of printers to look like, because like you get on there, it's a bit impressive. Like, there are printers all over the world, you know, and there's most likely a Prusa printer near you. So I get why he did it, but it's kind of shady the way he did it. Yeah. And that's kind of what everybody has it. Everybody feels that, you know, he literally just did this to put more dots on the map. It's very much an opt out model rather right. than an opt in. And you can opt in to get even more detailed information. If you want to show that here's my address for this printer. Yeah. That's possible. So the next thing that we had to talk about is a Hackaday article covering a project called JigFab. And uh, the headline is, JigFab makes woodworking easier. And it's a really cool concept. Uh, Basically, these guys made a Fusion 360 plugin where you can uh, click and add in things like finger finger joints or dovetail joints. And... Along with adding those into your 3D model projects, 
They also create jigs that um, you can laser cut out and fit up to, say, your drawer sideboards. They have jigs that you can laser cut out that set your bit depth for your router uh, or your drill depth for your drill. Like, the whole project is super cool. My main problem with it is, though, that if you have access to advanced tools like a, a laser cutter, you probably have access to advanced tools like a CNC router. So what's the point? And I, uh, I don't know. I, I, on one hand, I could definitely see us spending a little bit of time making the more generalized jigs and hanging them up in the wood shop in our makerspace. And I think that's a, an actually a really cool use for it. But on the other hand, if somebody, if this wasn't for like a generalized thing, if somebody had enough talent to add these joints in in their 3D model and laser cut all these jigs and do all this work, they probably have the talent to not have to use the hand tools to do the joinery and be able to use a CNC machine to do the joinery. So on one hand, I think it's neat. On the other hand, I'm not sure I understand the purpose once you get that deep if that makes sense yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, it is it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to justify when you already have the other tools available to make something better why <laughs> if you don't have a cnc router and all you have is a laser cutter yeah totally i i totally see it. but like in, in the video they have an origin shaper at at one point, which can do most of the joinery they're making jigs for. Mm. Um, and I don't, I don't know, Aaron, thoughts? <laughs> yeah, so you have, you have a very good point. My my initial thought was, it, it does seem very neat for, you know, specific use cases and maybe one off projects, but. So the example video they had was building a drawer or like a shelf or a, I don't know, some sort of shelf that has a cabinet drawer in it. And it generated something like four different jigs just to assemble that. So on one hand, I will say drawers I guess are if you, hard. Like if you build a drawer from scratch, like you need a lot of jigs for drawers, especially if you're going to make like six that need to match. Then maybe that's fine. Yeah. I've never made a drawer, so I don't know. But it just is like a lot, a lot of jigs for just the drawer. And and like you said, you know, you're you're working with a three D model for one thing, to like make your model, and then from there it will generate the jigs. They then have to go laser cut. And if you're not laser cutting, you'll probably route them out. But at that point, and you know, like you said, just route the things out. Yeah. Uh, but it does seem kind of neat to, because I've actually been thinking about this today and yesterday. I'm I'm making a, uh, I'm trying to make a new uh, mount for that um, PrinterBot Simple Pro for the Titan Arrow, and I'm thinking about doing it in aluminum. But as I'm thinking about it, you know, you route the aluminum flat, and then where does it bend? And you have to get the bend radius right so that all the dimensions match up. And I wasn't sure how to handle that. Oh, I can tell you how to do that. Yeah, because I've but like, done like, that. But stuff like that, these, th this seems like it'd be a good fit for it, where it kind of, it, it's a bit more work, but it allows you to manually align things much better than you would be able to do without it, which is kind of the whole point of a jig. Yeah. So do you want to know how to do the jig for the thing that you want to do? Yes. This is actually helpful for other Cause people. It's kind of racking, I've been racking my brain all day about it. Okay, so uh, you need Fusion 360, and yeah. uh, you use sheet metal in Fusion. Yeah. So what you're doing is sheet metal work, right? Yeah, I watched a video on that okay, so, today already. Um, in sheet, if you're doing a sheet metal bend like this, uh, you have to start slightly different than you would with a normal part. You need to go into the sheet metal module and do a sketch in the sheet metal module. And when you do the sketch, you do the first flat surface that you want to do. Mm -hmm. So it would be like the bigger flat that is going to be on your bent piece right. for your mount, right? And then um, it, once you're out of the sketch, 
instead of going to extrude where you would normally go to, you go to the flange module and you make a sheet metal flange and you make it the thickness um, or you click on it and then you pick a sheet metal rule that's close to the thickness of sheet metal that you want to use. And sometimes you might have to make a new rule. Um, and then once to make the bend, you do the same thing, except for you don't have to make a sketch this time. You just click on the edge that you want that bent face to stick out from, and you say flange, and then you tell it how long that flange is going to be. So now you've got like your bent angle. Okay. Yeah. And then you go into flat pattern, and you tell it which edge is going to stay flat. It will flatten it out and it will put three lines in and uh, three lines where your bend is. And the two outer lines are the, the uh, beginning of the radius and the end of the radius for your bend. Because sheet metal always has a radius as it bends. It's right. called the K factor. And then the middle line is the center point of that bend. And uh, what I do when I need to make bending jigs is I take... Uh, the flat pattern and there's a button in it to export a DXF and I export the DXF and I take it into Lightburn and I make a jig um, that has the outline of my um, my flat part and I offset that outline by a quarter millimeter so the flat part will drop in to the cutout that I'm making and then I take those three lines and I etch those three lines far past my part that I'm going to cut out. Is this making sense still? Kind of. Okay, so it'll make a DXF of your part and um, you're going to cut that part out of a sheet of plywood. Uh, for example. Or a piece of paper. Yeah. A piece of paper route will actually work depending on how thick your metal is. Um, I usually try to make a find a piece of wood or piece of plastic that's the same thickness as the metal I'm bending. And I'll cut out the piece of metal and I'll or the the shape of the part that I'm bending and have those three lines etched far past the edges of the part that I cut. And then I'll drop the metal for the part that I'm bending into the area that I cut out. And then take a ruler and line it up with those lines and then scribe it oh, with the Sharpie. Gotcha. And then use a... I usually, I have an arbor press and some V-blocks and a couple other things that I've set up to do some simple bends. But you can even do something like that in a bench vise. Where you, like line up the that center line with the edge of the bench vise, especially since you're going to do thin aluminum. You just line up that mm -hmm. center line just slightly above your jaw, and you can fold it over and get a pretty good bend. I don't know. It's kind of convoluted. It's hard to, te hard to describe over text or uh, speech without... No, I think I think I got it. Yeah. Yeah. You're making a, sl a, a larger wood model with the same lines. Yeah. So as your metal part, so you can, because that's what I was trying to figure out. How do you how do you translate the line where you need to bend it? Yeah. Onto the metal, so you can bend it. That that's what I've been trying to figure out. Yeah. So I just cut the outline of the shape out of a larger piece of wood, and have those three lines scribed bigger, using my laser cutter, and then I'll drag it. I have it. one of those now. I have I have bent several hundred metal parts using this method, and it works great. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Learning yeah. things on Makers on Tap. Chris <laughs> is like, I am so bored. I don't even know what you guys are doing now. <laughs> I just, I gotta, I gotta spend time learning. That was a huge <laughs> tangent. It was, a, it was a huge tangent. <laughs> Jigs are fun. Um, so the one part of Jig Fab, let's get back to the thing I was talking about. The one part of Jig Fab that I did see useful is uh, for edge jigs. Um, some CNC routers have an overhang portion where you can do edge cutting for like dovetails or finger joints and cutting like that. And uh, but like my CNC router that has a moving uh, cut bed, there's no way I could do that with my router. So in that instance, I, I see jig fab being really great, being able to do edge jigging. But some of the other stuff they were doing, I, I'm not 
sure i see the point but it is a super cool project and you can tell somebody put a lot of thought into it so i definitely will give them credit there joe we had one of our very first listener feedback questions oh, yeah. to our email address. Makersontap at gmail.com. We this do is from read B. It. Howard 1122. He said he listened to our episodes. There's one thing he'd like to hear more about. Uh, you mentioned that you didn't like smoothie for CNC routers, and he was wondering why. Um, it's simple. Um, smoothie and Gerbil run in similar ways and um neither of them let you uh jog in a reliable way so they you it, the jog buttons happen in specified increments at a specified speed um and if you hold that button down it will bank up those increments and just potentially run your machine into a limit switch or off the edge of your table or um, into your hand in a pinch point, and that bothers me. Um, the I, I'm hesitant to say much more uh, because I have recently uh, revisited the smoothie board that I was using to control CNC, and I had some other problems with it. And I'm wondering if the problems I had with Smoothie CNC were more based on the specific board I was using and less based on Smoothie Wear itself. Um, but yeah, it, that was that was most of it. I had some communication issues. I was trying to use BCNC to drive it, and um, little things like. If I ran into an error, I would have to completely restart everything to get out of that error was problematic. Um, I, I would I would like to revisit Smoothie with CNC at some point and find out if it was more the board that I was fighting than actually Smoothie wear itself. So our main topic for tonight is where do you get your inspiration for making? Chris, how about you? Um, okay. So I, I actually kind of got called out, um, this, this past week, um, specifically about this, uh, my workout buddy who I work out five days a week with, um, kind of asked me what my goals were for this next year. Um, not, not new year's resolutions or anything like that, but just like what are my goals? And because they're a very project and goal oriented person. And so yeah. they couldn't wrap their head around me not having goals at the time. <laughs> and so they were very much like, no, you need to go home this weekend and make some goals. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That's probably true. I need to actually come up with something. I need to actually figure out what I'm going to do. And, um, I'd kind of gotten back to it and realized that a lot of my maker stuff had kind of taken a back seat and it was, I was able to justify it with work. Um, I was, I'm, I'm in a very busy point in the year. Um, this is probably one of the busiest points in the whole year that will happen. Um, and so I was kind of able to, able to justify it and like throw it around and whatnot, but when I really sat down and thought about it, I was like, I'm really shortchanging myself. Like, I know I can be doing better and I know I can be making, but I'm not. And so I kind of called myself out on that and I've, I've now set a goal. Um, I'm going to be pushing myself to make uh, one video of higher quality a month. Um I want to actually like get back into my like realm of storytelling that I used to be in um, and what I really had a passion for and really enjoyed doing. Um, I want to get back to that. And so I'm going to try and push myself to make one video a month starting in, in May uh, and knock that out over the course of the next year and just like 
it may be about something that I've been working on and had like some scripts possibly in the works for, or it may just be something where I'm doing like a travel vlog and being like, here's where I'm at in the world right now. And all of this crazy stuff is happening. Um, it could be anything like that, but I want to get back into the habit of creating storytelling, um, stuff. And so that, that is what pushed me to get my inspiration again. Um, it's just having a friend who kind of called me on my shit and <laughs> told me that I needed to do something. <laughs> I'm chuckling because I've had that same conversation with that same person. <laughs> <laughs> Fair um, enough. When you say a video of higher quality, what's that mar what what is that um what's that metric weighing against? Is it higher quality than last month? So higher quality question. than you've ever made before? Yeah, like here's the thing is I can put out a video, like I'm not counting the the podcast. Um like I I I put out the podcast and I by the way, we're on YouTube now. Um, if you didn't already know, um, all of the backlogs on YouTube. It's a manual process. It's a manual process. It is. Not that, Chris? Yeah. I mean, it, it's all good. Um, I enjoy doing it. It was kind of fun getting back into that habit uh, of just kind of like playing around with the tools and whatnot. But um, I'm not allowing that to count. Um, I'm not saying that that should be something. When I say higher quality, I want it to actually be um story driven i want it to actually have like a a purpose um for the video to actually do something um and so that's that's kind of what i mean by higher quality is something that actually has a purpose to it um and that's that's kind of what i'm going to be trying to do is just get into that again it's a very smart goal yeah <laughs> it is it is specific it is measurable. Oh my god! Achievable. It is relevant. I to quit your the interests. podcast. I quit and better it jobs. It is time than bound. This. <laughs> quit better jobs than this. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. My god. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, how about you? Do you have any smart goals? Oh dear god! I've got some dumb ones. Um. <laughs> I need to make a really good acronym for dumb that just makes everyone go, huh? And then I'm like, I they explain it. And then they're like, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, yeah, it's dumb, right? Um, Doable no, I, under is manageable duration. duration. <laughs> it is unreal. It is manageable and believable. Uh, not unreal, understandable. There you or, go. Or uh, undertakeable. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, that's the part in the acronym where the undertaker just shows up and he goes, yes, you can do it. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so I take my inspiration from all kinds of things. Today I was at a uh, children's museum uh, near Chicago and I just walked around and I love children's museums, one, just because they're they're always amazing. And like I I walk around and I see these installations that are so creative and like um they're so smart in how they're built and interactive, but they're also very beautiful usually. Uh and, and this this children's museum was like uh it was, it was very special in that sense. And there were a couple of things. There was one uh, think that it was a uh, water faucet and uh, it was built out of um, some massive copper pipe way overbuilt in that sense but uh, much of it was also uh, brazed in brass horns like parts of trumpets and saxophones Ooh. and so it, all of this stuff just like kind of builds into this art um and then there was another uh, portion with a Geneva gear that uh, inspired a project idea that I'm not even going to talk about because I'll probably never make it, uh, but I really want to make it. Um, and uh, it, just seeing the creativity that other people can bring forth always pushes me to be better. 
Um, because like I see it, I'm just like, why why am I not creating like that? Uh, why am I creating in the way that I create, and uh, how how can I push that even stronger? Aaron, how about you? I don't really feel that inspirational with my projects. I'm very functional in that in that mindset. So a lot of my my projects are more of they they more stem from necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. Type thing. So it's more like I need something or the makerspace needs something and these are the problems that it has and so this is my best guess as to fix it. Yeah. Mm. And then from there it's it's iterative. You know whether whether or not my implementation works or not, we can just keep iterating on it. But and I don't that, know. that's how I am too, and that, that's why I like going to places like children's museums or art museums and, and seeing the creativity that other people have. Because I'm always drawn to art. I I was an art major for a short period of my life, but I never sit down and take the time to create the stuff that inspires me. Because there's always something that needs to be done there's always an, a necessary project to be done instead of the creating for the sake of creation which is something that i really want to get to that's something that i need to work on because i i cannot create just for creation's sake it's always a function it's always a a need yeah other than a want fair enough yeah, like, one of the things that always pushes me is seeing really incredible sci-fi um, I, I, in my head, I'm a prop builder and I, I really want to build all these things that aren't necessarily cosplay, but like, I really just want a whole wall of proton packs and traps. And I have wanted those things since I was five and I have the capability of building all of them now, but I won't give myself the time to do it. And that makes me angry. <laughs> gonna lie um that's uh i relate to that so it's like <laughs> every time that adam puts out a one day build on the yeah. tested channel yeah i just want to make it and i just want to like mount it on a wall <laughs> and just have it there because it's like no i'd love to have the freaking sword from excalibur just hanging on my wall so that i could be like yeah no nope, just made that i just want to do one day builds to make his workshop yeah, yeah. Like, I don't care about any of the props he makes or any of the projects, but I want to make the lighting fixture he has and his, you know, his parts storage. Like, that's what I want to make. But, yeah. But why? Like, so you're kind of where I am now, where you're, you're building a workshop to get to a point. But once you're to that point, what do you want to make? And, like, that's where I've been. My my whole maker journey has been to get to the point to make a robot arm. And I still haven't made it. And like that in itself is kind of neat and terrible all at the same time, right? Like 10 years to build a robot arm. I've built routers. I've built laser cutters. I've built 3D printers. I've built all of these incredible tools. I've retrofit machine tools i've never built the one thing that drove me to start my maker creator journey which was a robot arm i i've just never done it and it, it falls into the propon proton pack wall area for me now it, it doesn't serve a purpose other than i i would like to build it and i would like to spend some time on it and i i just haven't done it and that's, i mean personally that's, i I think that that that's not necessarily true because like the process of you building that robot arm is going to teach you so freaking much that you're going to gain so much more experience off that. It's not just going to be a prop. Oh yeah, totally. But like, it, it doesn't serve a purpose in my maker world right now. Like I like my router got me to the next step of being able to make parts for my, my mill and my laser cutter. And I, I I haven't needed a robot arm, so I haven't built the robot arm. And like, that's kind of silly. I started building all of these things to get to the point where I could have the capability to make the parts I needed to make my robot arm. 
I don't really have a singular project that I'm working towards. For me, it's more of collecting the skills. Yeah. So, like, I, I, I always love those projects where you're just like, I want to make a thing. And then you just want to make that thing, like, that day. Yeah. And then being able to have the skills to just, like, knock it out and just make a thing. Like, that's that's what I want. That That's what I like, and that's what, that's what I aspire to get to, which is I want to make a thing, and I want to know exactly what it needs to do. Or, like, like, like the, the, the sheet metal part for the, the printer bot. Mm-hmm. Like, my, my first thought was, like, I can just 3D print it. But, you know, as I was thinking about it, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming very space constrained. And a three millimeter thick piece of plastic is going to flex more than a three millimeter piece of aluminum. Mm-hmm. So I want to be able to use the right, you know, material for the application. But now we're getting into, you know, more milling and sheet metal parts and bending, which I haven't done before. And that it gets me a little anxious because I haven't done that yet. Oh. Yeah. So I love collecting those skills. So when I, when I come to that, when I want to make something, I'm like, oh, yeah, sheet metal part. Oh. Needs a ninety degree bend. I know how to do that. Yeah. You know, just 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 snaps right in place. You know. You know what I want to get to is where I have the patience and focus to work on something for five years. And like I'm specifically talking, this was this was actually something I wanted to talk about in uh, the news section, and I completely forgot about it. But did you guys see that post I made in our makerspace Slack? with the guy who made the Minecraft computer. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Spent five years making a quad core computer in Minecraft. Yep. That is dedication that I just don't have. Yeah. I, I would have, have been dedication. bored with that in about six hours. That is incredible. I want to meet that dude and just talk to him for 10 minutes and just understand how his brain works so that I can focus on a task for even a week. <laughs> well, and not only that, like, that's not the first one. That's I version know. five. <laughs> like, that just blows my mind that this dude just has that much determination to stick on one project and continually work at it. Like, dude's And it's incredible. not like the computer does a lot. Like, it's an 8-bit computer. Like, it... it had a cool counting program and a cool drawing program, but like, you know, very much with our projects, his project wasn't to build a computer that could draw. His project was to build the computer and, and go through that process. And the drawing thing was just a happy end goal. Right. Yeah. So like, that is just, that is just incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Like, yeah, I, I just, I just wish I had that much determination. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't I know. could not stick with any project for five years. No. Granted, it, the max the, the the access control system is on year two. I yeah, think. but it's on like day six. So <laughs> <laughs> get wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> and I could say that because I do that crap too. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> Oh man! Ouch! <laughs> it's, uh, I'm being mean. It's on like day fourteen. <laughs> oof! The mighty oof! Yeah, right in the free time. Right in the free time. <laughs> hey man, I I am I'm just I'm the same way though. I I'm joking, but I I am exactly the same way. I'll I'll get started on something. It's it's why my mill CNC conversion has taken five years. I haven't worked on it for five years straight. I work on it for like a week at a time and I get it running really good. And then I find some little hiccup and then I completely disassemble it and I walk away from it for a year. And then I have to remember how to put it back together. You know? And that's where the mill is going to start back up this week. I think, I, I don't know. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Anything well, else you want to add? I don't know that uh, that link that Chris just posted with the the storm that's coming looks pretty terrifying. <laughs> I haven't looked at it yet. Let me pull it up. Yeah. Well, I was just in Chicago and uh, we we packed all of our clothes to go to Chicago. I was there for the whole weekend. We packed all of our clothes on Friday when it was summer for summer, 
and then we got to Chicago and it snowed six inches. So, um, like I'm a six little... inches. Yeah. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. It was just six inches of icy slush. It was terrible. <laughs> it... Yeah. <laughs> nah, the storm is like that bad. <laughs> it looks like it could definitely cause some winds and possibly a little bit of surges. That's yeah. why I'm saying like, hey, we may want to we may want to call it. <laughs> Look, I live in the country where the wind blows and the power goes out. I, the wind's just like and my power is like, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was I in your way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> these are the kind of nights where the pre- 3D printers just don't run. Because <laughs> there's no point. It's just gonna waste plastic. Oh, uh, fair enough. All right, guys, no. I'm good. This I'm has good. been a fun podcast. <laughs> yeah, this is a good episode. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions or whatever, want to get a hold of us, you know, feel free to email us. Share the things that inspire you. Wh- what do you walk across and see? I'll I'll send Aaron some pictures I took of the at the Children's Museum to show you guys of like. Things, things that like always inspire me to make and and do more stuff. So share that with us. Make, yeah. make we've got we've got the Reddit's and the Facebooks and the, and the Twitters. Aaron and I have been super active on Twitter lately, which makes no sense at all because we both hate Twitter, but it's been fun. It's all right, <laughs> Chris. You should be on Twitter more. We have I a good will... time. Most of it is just Aaron and I making fun of each other. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. I'm, I, I'm trying to branch out into more software development things because right now it's just all 3D printing. It's like the same 10 people 3D printing stuff. But So I'm trying to get out of that. You know. <laughs> all right. Keep making stuff, guys. This is the end of the podcast. <laughs>